As you can see up here, I titled it, From Saul to Paul, A Life Devoted to God. Um, and just like Rod was saying, the way that, uh, that I approach teaching and, and what I feel like um, God is, is saying to me is, is what I want to bring to you guys. And so through some of my, uh, my study and my quiet time, Lord led me to um, really start digging into the life of Saul, um, who later became Paul. And I think one of the things that was so intriguing about it is the fact that he reminds me so much of myself or myself reminds me of him and his life. And, and I'll kind of break some of that down so that you can really start to understand it. But this guy, I mean, he, he just had such an incredibly um, captivating life. You start looking at all the things that he did, the places that he went, the things that he experienced, and, and it's, it's absolutely intriguing. So, Saul, whenever we go over here to Acts chapter 7, I'm going to start breaking down just a little. Basically, I want to introduce to you who Saul is, or reintroduce to most of you who Saul is, and, and start to show you a picture of this guy's life from when he started to really become devoted to God in his own mind and in his own thought process, and then whenever God started to just totally change his life and how God specifically chose him to make an impact on the world forever. Here we are talking about this guy 2,000 years later. So we go to Acts chapter 7, verse 58. And the story here, I'm not going to read through every bit of it line by line, but this was the story of the stoning of Stephen. This is right after Jesus went to the cross. Um, not right after, but within a few years of him going to the cross, Stephen is, is in the synagogue speaking to the, um, the religious leaders of the time, and he has been overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's just laying this out for them. And they don't like it. In fact, they think that it's heresy. And they, they become very upset, so much so that they start acting like children. That it says that they plugged their ears and started yelling loudly. <laughs> like, that just gives me a vision of kids like, you know. It's, it's like, what are you doing? You're acting like a bunch of children. But anyhow, then they take it a little bit farther. They take Stephen out and they stone him to death. They stone him to death, but at the, in the time that they're stoning him, he does the same thing that Jesus did, and he asked God to forgive them, to not hold it against them. But if you look in it, it says that there was a young man there by the name of Saul, and all the people that were, that were witnessing this, that were, that were being part of it, they were laying their, their cloaks down at the feet of Saul. It says that he was there, they were laying their cloaks down at the feet of him, and he was consenting to the death of Stephen. He agreed to it. Now, let me give you a little bit of history on why he agreed to it and what he was doing there in the first place. So, whenever Saul was, well, first of all, he was born in the city of Tarsus, uh, Tarsus in the province of Cilicia, and that was in what's now considered Turkey. And I don't know if you guys know this, but that's where the uh, Noah's Ark was actually found. I just did a bunch of research on it, studied it, sent some videos to my kids and stuff. But they legitimately found it. If anybody wants that, you can come and see me afterwards, and I'll shoot it out to you in an email or something. But they found Noah's Ark there, which is so cool. I love history. Anyhow, that city was a, a Greco-Roman city, and it's in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean. So it was a Roman, uh, Saul was a Roman citizen. He was born in this town, and that made him a Roman citizen, and that comes into play in his life later on down the road. But what that did for him is it gave him the knowledge of the Greek language, philosophy, and culture. So he grew up in that, so he was able to um, really understand the culture, understand where these, these uh, Greeks were coming from, and where... 
uh, the Gentiles essentially were coming from because he kind of grew up in that culture that was kind of like a melting pot, really. But his family, they were all devout Jews. And so whenever he was approximately 13 years old or so, they sent him off into Jerusalem to study under the famous teacher uh, Gamaliel, I think is how you pronounce that, Gamaliel. But the word says that he proved himself to be superior and to be a superior and zealous student. So here he is. Think about um, a 13-year-old boy that was raised in a devout Jewish family. He's got all this, this knowledge from his parents, but then they send him off to Jerusalem to study under literally the most profound teacher at the time, and he was the best student at that time. So he was quickly rising to be a leader within the, the Jewish Sanhedrin and the Jewish um, uh, council. That's what He was on that fast track, you know? Um, essentially, like, for us, it would be like going to Harvard or Yale or, or something like that, and, and not only to go there, but to excel far be, above everybody else. So his family had really set him up for absolute success in that culture, in that religion. That's going to play out very, very... Um, it's going to be very important that we know and understand that as we, as we kind of dig into Saul's life and what happens here. So essentially, Saul has been, has been taught to believe that Christianity is, is absolute heresy and that it was a major threat to Judaism, major threat, because they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he, that he was truly the Messiah. Most of them didn't. And so ultimately, that's... That's the thought process that he has. And growing up in that culture, he would believe that anybody that was to come against uh, Judaism at the time, that, that it was okay for them to be persecuted, to be thrown in jail, to be beat, to be tortured, to be killed, essentially. And it says that he right here, that he consented to the death of Stephen. He consented to his death. That is it's sad to think because he was pretty young at that time. So in Acts 8, 1 through 3, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So this was his, this was his mission in life. And I think up until the time that he was, you know, roughly 13 and, and saw that... Um, saw that murder of Stephen, he was, he was still just learning. But after that, he got a taste of, of what he was going to be doing throughout the next few years of his life. And uh, it, it set him on a very, very destructive course, an extremely destructive course. So this happened in Damascus and Syria in about 37 A.D. And A.D. Um, is Anno Domini, and it's Latin for in the year of our Lord. But what that is, is it's referring to the birth of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus. So Jesus died whenever he was 33 years old, and this was at 37 AD. So obviously that's about four years after Jesus was killed, right? And Saul is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So Jesus was murdered about four years ago, and he now he's you know, 15, 16, maybe 17-ish, somewhere around that age, and he's still breathing these threats. He's still been doing this, so much so that he goes back and he gets absolute permission. He gets an arrest warrant, essentially, to go out and collect Christians. But here's the thing about being a Christian in that time. You not only had the Greeks, the Romans, all these people that were essentially at this point, they were murdering Christians, putting them, their bodies on, on stakes and then burning them at night to light the streets. They were putting them into uh, auditoriums to where their bodies were being ripped to pieces by wild animals. They were being forced to fight to the death against these gladiators and stuff. These things actually really did happen, but not only were they under attack from them, they were also under attack from the Jewish people, from the Sanhedrin, people like Paul. Now, the word doesn't specifically say that Paul himself, or Saul at the time, ever personally murdered anyone. We couldn't find that anywhere. I couldn't find that anywhere. 
Um, if any of you know of a place where it does show that, please let me know, but I couldn't find it anywhere. However, that doesn't mean that he wasn't collecting these Christians and what happened to them after that, you know, we don't know. But what I do know is he was a very devastating figure to the Christian faith, and we'll see that more as we, as we go on this journey of Saul's life. So, in Acts 9, we're, I'm not going to just read all the way through all this stuff. I'm going to just hit some main points that I think are, are very important to highlight the life of, of Saul. So, we're going to jump over to Acts 9. And in Acts 9, 3, it says, suddenly... So, let me lay out the, the scene of what we're talking about here. So, Saul had just went and got that search warrant for Christians, Right? He was absolutely determined to annihilate Christians off the face of the earth. So he goes and gets the search warrant. He's on his road. He's on a road to Damascus with a bunch of other dudes, like-minded individuals, if you will. And he suddenly sees a light from heaven. This light from heaven, the word says, flashed around him. It flashed around him. Verse 4 says, um, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, something that I found pretty interesting is a few years ago, I was listening to a teaching from Robert Morris, and he pointed out the fact that there's no donkey and there's no horse listed in this story. Now, I don't know. For me, I was under the impression that he fell off a horse or a donkey or something, and I'm like, wait a minute. He's got to be wrong. So I started looking and searching, and you know what? Sure enough, I couldn't find a horse or a donkey, but it did say that he fell to the ground. So he sees this bright light, this light from heaven. A bright light from heaven has got to be brighter than any light that we've ever seen, right? I mean, if, if you're describing something from heaven, it's got to be super, super bright. Have you ever been in the dark and had some jerk flash, uh, flashlight in your eyes? All of my, my wife and my kids have. Yeah, Kyrie just looks at me and goes, you you do, and I do. I think it's kind of funny, but um, it's super rude. I probably shouldn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> so they see, he sees a super bright flash of light, and he falls to the ground, and he hears a voice that says, Saul, why do you persecute me? This has got to be a game changer, an absolute game changer. Super bright light, the, the power of God, the force of God itself takes him to the ground. Takes him to the ground, and then he hears a voice asking him, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who are you, Lord? He calls him Lord. He says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus responds. Jesus responds. Look at your text. It says right there that Jesus says to him. Jesus says to him. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Wow. Your life's mission is to destroy people that believe in this guy that just knocked you to the ground? And you hear him say, it's me, bud. You wanted to find me, here I am. Oh, my goodness. And then, and then Jesus blinds him, puts scales on his eyes. Now, here's what's crazy. The other men that were there, the men stood, stood there speechless. The power of Jesus took Saul to the ground, but the other guys, they stood there watching what was going on in amazement. Jesus picked him out of a crowd and went boom and took him down because he had a purpose for him, because he had a plan for him. The dude that was going around essentially murdering or getting Christians murdered, Jesus had a plan for. So whenever I started this out and I said that this guy, this guy Saul that I'm reading about reminds me of me. Whenever Saul is in the middle of his sin, whenever he's in the middle of literally going against God, going against God, the man, God, the Almighty, is who Saul thought that he was working for. He thought he was doing the right thing. 
He was following the letter of the law, so much so that he was the very best at it in his class. He was the very best out of everybody that they could find. He was training under the very best. He was the very best, but he was wrong. He was wrong, dead wrong. So wrong. But God, God saw him in all of this, in all this junk that he was doing, in all this horrible stuff against his own people, against God's own people. But he saw what was beyond. He saw the potential in Saul. You know, Saul was trying to do what was right. He just didn't. He was being lied to. He was following the rituals, the culture, everything that he was being taught from the time he was a child, you know. And, and I can't blame him. I think if I was in his situation and I was as smart as him, I'd probably be doing the same thing. Ultimately, I think all of us would be. So God saw that God created Saul in his own image and in his own likeness. But he knew what he could do. He knew what he could do. So then it says, the other men, they stood there speechless. They heard Jesus, but they didn't see him. They heard him, but they didn't see him. I'm wondering if they saw the light, because if they would have saw the light, it probably would have blinded them too. I don't know. Is that not amazing, though? I think that that's so crazy. So now we go down to verse 9. It says, for three days that he was blind, and he didn't eat or drink. He just had a face-to-face -face personal encounter with the one he has been persecuting people for. You know, he's sitting here. It says that, that the friends that were with him, they help him up. Well, it says he got up, and then they helped him because he was blind. They helped him all the way into Damascus. I'm wondering what they're thinking. You know, they hear Jesus say this. Now their buddy that just fell down is totally blind, and they have to lead him into the city. But it says that for three days, he couldn't see a thing. Couldn't see a thing. That's got to kind of be a game changer. Not only did you hear Jesus, now he blinded you. You think it's probably going to be forever. I mean, I would have thought it was going to be forever. He didn't know that it wasn't going to be forever until God showed him in a vision that it wasn't. But, so he's not eating or drinking anything. I could probably, I can almost guarantee you that I wouldn't be eating or drinking anything either. I mean, this is a significant experience in this guy's life. So, then Jesus, in verse 10, it goes on, and it's talking about um, this dude, Ananias. Jesus comes to Ananias in a vision. Ananias is one of, um, he's a, a disciple, a follower of Jesus. In, in Damascus. And, and Jesus tells him, he says, he calls him in a vision, and Ananias says, yes, Lord. So then verses 11 through 11 and 12, he tells Ananias that there's this dude from Tarsus named Saul, and Ananias instantly, because uh, he knows what's coming. He knows that Saul has been sent there with a search warrant to clean him and his family out, to take him and throw him in prison. He knows this. The Word tells us that he knows this a little bit later. So it says that, uh, that Ananias is having this communication with God, and God tells him to go find Saul. He says, go find him, and, and it tells him what to do. It tells him what Saul will be doing, and here's what's crazy. Jesus tells Saul, or Jesus tells Ananias that Saul himself will be praying and that Ananias is going, or that Saul is going to see Ananias in a vision coming, laying his hands on him, praying for him, and he's going to be healed. That's what Jesus tells Ananias. Ananias is still like, what? He's telling him what to do, when to do it, where to do it. And sometimes, this is kind of a side note, but sometimes God tells us specifically exactly what to do. And we're supposed to follow that out. And sometimes he tells us generally what to do. So just like this, he tells Ananias exactly where to go, what he's going to see, what he's supposed to do, what he's supposed to say. He tells him all this stuff, right? Um, at one point in time, they were, uh, Jesus and his disciples were having a discussion about how to pay the taxes. And, and Jesus tells him, go down and go fishing, bring the coin out of the fish's mouth. Like, and it, it's so precise. It's so exact. Then there's other times where he says, go, 
and preach the gospel. And they're like, where? And he's like, yes, go. They're like, what will we take? Nothing. Just go. And wherever you go, you know, stay there if they accept you, whatever. But he didn't get super detailed. He does that with us sometimes. Sometimes we're going, God, what am I supposed to do? What do you want me to do? And he says, yes, yes, follow me, listen to me, read my word, seek my face. Seek the kingdom of God. Then all these things will be added unto you. But there's something else that I wanted to, I wanted to bring up real quick, and then we'll get right back on track. But I heard a, a preacher say this the other day, and I thought it was very profound. He was kind of calling me out a little bit, I think. He doesn't know me, but... Have you ever had people tell you um, that they can't hear God, that God's not talking to them, they can't, you know, they're, they're feeling so distant from him? Well, this pastor said that, he said, if you're only spending 10 minutes a day in this, but you're spending three, four, five hours on social media, on media itself, watching TV, listening to the radio, if you're doing that, 10 minutes in this, a long time in that, he said, then your depression is self-inflicted. If you're feeding yourself more with what the world thinks than, what, than with what God thinks, your, your depression is self-inflicted. So I was like, oh, all right. Thank you, sir. But it's, uh, it's something that we can all learn from. All right, so let's jump back into this. So verse 13. And I ask questions, uh, and Ananias questions the Lord, even with good reasoning and arguments. So, so God tells Ananias what to do, and he starts arguing. He's like, do you realize who this is? Do you know what this person's doing to your people? Your people. You want me to go to him? Do you want me dead? Is essentially what he's thinking. So then Jesus kind of, he kind of lays it out for him. He's like, hold up, just wait a second. Jesus replied, go. <laughs> That's the very first like, go. Like, shut your mouth, <laughs> go do what I told you to do. He says, go. And then he lays it out. He says, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Then he further says, to kind of seal the deal and get him to go. He says, I will show him, talking about Saul, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Does, does your translation say suffer? Jesus' plan was for this dude to suffer? You know he wrote a third of the New Testament, right? He was one of the leading Christians of their time. We're talking about the guy 2,000 years later because he, how he changed the face of the world through Christianity. God's plan was for him to suffer. Now, that word suffer kind of made in verse 17, it says, well, essentially Ananias just said, okay. Oh, you're going to make him suffer? Psh, all right, I can do that. So he gets up and he goes, you know. He had no problem with that. So then he healed him. Ananias goes, fulfills the vision that Jesus had just given to Saul. Jesus showed Saul that Ananias was going to come, lay hands on him, heal him, and that he would go pre preach the gospel. That's outstanding. But do you notice how Jesus spoke to both of these guys? You've got a devout Christian follower already established. You've got another dude that's persecuting Christians, but that's getting ready to start following. And Jesus spoke to both of them in a vision, gave them the same vision of what they were supposed to be doing. I think that's outstanding. It's kind of like whenever God gives me a word and then he confirms it through my wife, or he gives my wife a word and confirms it through me. You know, he's speaking to us. Or sometimes, you know, Rod will have a teaching. And... Um, the song list that Brittany picks just flows so perfectly with us. She had no idea what he was going to be teaching. He didn't have any idea what song she was going to pick. But God is moving together in his spirit, weaving us together 
as that one body of Christ. And it was, we can see that all through the Word, and that's what he was doing here too. So it says that he healed him, and Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized. Isn't that amazing? He goes, gets healed, had laid, hands laid on him. He was prayed over. He was healed, filled with the Holy Spirit, and baptized. I think that all those, those things are very, very important, and it's something that we need to grasp a hold of. We need to grasp these things. Sometimes we just think that, that we just need to get healed. Sometimes some people think, well, I just need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And some people say, well, I've been baptized. I don't need anything else. Wrong. We need it all. Why are we just taking little bits and pieces and leaving power back here? You want to walk in power? Do it all. Get it all. So, 19 through 20, Paul spends several days with the disciples in Damascus and then begins to preach in the synagogue, or at once begins to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. So, where did Saul come from? The synagogues, those leaders. What had he been raised up and trained up in? The knowledge of these people. God gave him intimate knowledge and wisdom and understanding of the Torah, of the law, of the Jewish culture. Intimate. Nobody knew it like this dude did. So he could go and effectively witness to them. And, and here's what I love. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'll get to it in just a second. Whenever I get to it, though, you'll like it. It says, he grew more powerful and baffled the Jews by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. <laughs> he took the knowledge that God gave him and he proved that Jesus was the Messiah. What did he use to do that with? The Old Testament, the law, what he was already given, Isaiah. He used all of these, these Old Testament scriptures that had been fulfilled through Jesus Christ, and he proves it. He lays it out and says, here you go. Yet some of them, they were the ones that were blind. They were the ones that still didn't want to listen to the fact that he came to fulfill the law, that he came to save them, that he came to set them free and to rescue them, just like he did with Paul, Saul at the time. He proved it. He proved it, is what the word says. And Here's what's crazy. Verse 23, the very next one. This is where his suffering begins. This is truly where his suffering begins. Jesus says, I'm going to show him how much he's got to suffer for my name's sake. This is where it begins. The Jews try to kill Saul. The ones that he was just ministering to, the ones that he proved that Jesus Christ was truly the Messiah, they turn, whoop, Turn the table. He was trying to kill them. He was trying to kill Christians. Now they're trying to kill him. Isn't it crazy how that happens? But here's something else that's crazy. Saul knew this was going to happen. He knew the tenacity of these people. He knew where he was going. He's walking into the lion's den. Walking in to the lion's den. That's where he was going. But it said he immediately went. Immediately went to prove it. So then the Jews are trying to kill him. Some of the people save him. He gets out of town in verse 26. It says, Saul went to Jerusalem and tried joining the disciples there, but more suffering for Jesus. He goes there, but the disciples were afraid of, of him. So then Barnabas had to straighten them out. Uh, he, he meets with Barnabas. Barnabas listens to him and all that stuff. And Barnabas goes and, tells, goes and tells the other disciples, look, this dude really did have a straight up uh, change of character, change of heart. He's actually been converted. So then he gets into a relationship with them. And what does he start doing in verse 29? He starts debating with the Hellenistic Jews. So Hellenistic Jews are the ones that essentially adopted the Greek language and the Greek culture. But they're still Jews. They're just 
speaking that language. They're living that lifestyle, but that's why they call them the Hellenistic Jews. That's what they do. And then what do the Hellenistic Jews do? They try to kill him too. More suffering. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that Paul, Saul, sorry at the time, I really do think that he absolutely knew that this was coming for him. However, he had an absolute, real, authentic meeting with the Lord face to face. He experienced it. He experienced it. Now, the experiencing God is something that I talked about a couple months ago, that whenever you experience something, it can't be taken away from you. Somebody can sit there and try to tell you all day long, but you experienced it. You personally felt God. You personally saw God. You personally had that one-on-one -on -one experience. I don't know if I told you guys this, but here's, here's an experience that I got to witness um, firsthand. I was working with a, a Christian music group, and they actually sang the second to the last song, Throne Room, but we were in this this awesome auditorium, and it had just the best sound ever. And those people, whenever you hear them sing in person, it's just like chills on your body and stuff because God truly did meet us in that room, truly did. I was standing on the outskirts because I was just there to protect them. That was it. However, I love music, and I love to worship. I don't know if any of you noticed that. And I'm standing way back on the outskirts of this room, and as they're singing, angels literally joined in with them. I didn't see them, but I heard them. And I felt it. I'm like, what in the world is going on? And the sound went up and down. It was almost like being in a little boat on the ocean in these big swells up and down. That was, that was what I was hearing. That was what I was feeling. And I started to remember that I had experienced some stuff like that whenever I was a little kid in this tiny town that I grew up in. It was a Pentecostal church, and I, I, I remember that feeling. It was, it was familiar to me, but it, it did it like three times. It swelled up and down, and I'm like, what is going on? And then it swelled up bigger and down, and I mean, I got goosebumps now just thinking about it. I don't know if anybody can see that, but then it did it again real big the third time, and then it just went whoosh. And I watched about 150 to 200 people go, Pfft. I mean, it looked like somebody took a giant board and just went, wham, and like dropped them to the floor. All of them, boom, out. I'm like, what? <laughs> it was awesome. It was so awesome. You couldn't plan it. And I was there all week. It wasn't planned, I promise. They're just, bam, they're out. We've got people like professional videographers. We've got people that are professionally there mixing sound and stuff, and they're like, uh, what do we do, you know? And they're like standing here, like still trying to record people and they're like starting to get up and they're just sobbing and like snot and, and spit and everything. They probably wouldn't be happy that I'm telling you that. But, but uh, they're just like, they can't even get up off the ground. Some of them are just sitting there. Some of them are like holding each other and just crying and, and some are still singing. It was just nuts. But that's an experience Whenever you feel God, nobody can take that away. Nobody could ever tell me that that didn't happen because I experienced it. I watched it. I felt it. I heard it. It was real. It is real. He is real. That's exactly what Saul's going through here. That's why he's going back into the temple to tell the people, his friends, that he loves, that he's grown up with, that he respects. He's telling these people, and they turn on him, and they try to kill him. They want him dead, because this is heresy. Whoops, glad I didn't break that. This is heresy. You're coming against our religion, something that's been set in stone, that was given to Abraham and Moses? You're coming against them? Absolutely not. The thing is, he wasn't coming against them. He was showing them that it's been completed, that it's been fulfilled, that they don't have to do that anymore. They don't have to live that lifestyle. They don't have to try to be perfect. They've been made perfect by the blood of the Lamb, by the Messiah that was already foretold. He fulfilled 
Hundreds of prophecies. Hundreds. You know what's crazy? I didn't do the math on this because I'm not great with math. But <laughs> Robert Morris talks about how if you take a silver dollar and you like mark on it, put some kind of mark on it, and then picture the state of Texas. Texas is big. Everything's bigger in Texas, but not these silver dollars. They're still the same size silver dollars. But imagine Texas, and it's got a foot of silver dollars all over the face of Texas. You take that one silver dollar and you chuck it out there somewhere. The odds of one person fulfilling, fulfilling as many prophecies as Jesus is like somebody being dropped out in the middle of Texas, reaching down and picking up that same silver dollar that you threw out there. But they didn't want to believe it. They didn't want to believe that he truly did come to set them free. But he did. So the first time that Saul goes on a missionary journey, essentially he was, he was out, man. I mean, he was out. He was sold out for Christ as soon as he had that interaction with Jesus. But from that point... His, his documented first missionary trip, like he supposedly took three throughout his life, but his whole life after that was a missionary journey. But the three, it says that the first one was uh, he set out on roughly 45 A.D. Roughly 45 A.D. So he started out all this stuff in 37 A.D. He was approximately 13. In about 45 A.D., he goes out on his first missionary journey. And this part, this time, is when he was in Antioch. Saul and Barnabas were there and several other disciples, and they were all worshiping the Lord and fasting. That's something that I really probably ought to start doing again. I just, I have a hard time with it, man. I like food. So, but I do need to start again because the Word lays it out so clearly that it's, it's detrimental to our relationship. And to our power, like I said, being baptized, having the Holy Spirit, all these things, they're, they're detrimental to the part of having that power. So here they were. They were worshiping the Lord and fasting. And here's what's awesome. It says, oh, sorry, we're in chapter 13. If, if you want to go there, you can. You don't have to. But in chapter 13, it says, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said to them. Did anybody pick up on who said that? I didn't, I, I didn't want to just blow right over it. But the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Right here, God tells us that he called Saul. He called him. He tells us that earlier, but the Holy Spirit is confirming that he called him to his work right here. In chapter 13. So the first time that it's documented that the name of Saul goes to Paul is in chapter 13, verse 9. It says, they traveled to the island, and this is kind of paraphrased too, they traveled to the island uh, of Solomus, Sol, Solmias, I don't know, I can't speak that language very well. And in, in uh, Paphos is the first time that, that Saul's Name has changed to Paul. Now, I looked up, there's, there's so much importance in a name. So much importance in a name. We were going to name uh, one of our daughters something, and I, I'm not going to say what it is in case somebody's named that, but we we're going to name our daughter something, and Brittany's like, oh, I don't, I don't like that name. And I'm like, okay, well, I've always liked that name. You know, I didn't really, I didn't really think too much about it. So we looked it up. And it was like woman of sorrow or something like that. I'm like, whew, dodged a bullet there. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be sitting there every time you call your child something, you're proclaiming this over them. That's, uh, that's probably not the best thing. So Saul's name was changed. And so I'm like, what does Saul mean and what does Paul mean? And so I looked it up. And Saul means to ask 
or question. That's what Saul means, to ask or question. That makes sense. As he's growing up, he's asking and he's questioning all these things about um, his culture and the background, the history, the everything. But then he gets transformed into Paul. And this transformation started on the road to Damascus. It's very clear that whenever he started this relationship with God, that God changed who he was, right? I mean, he was going this way, and God hits him, and now he's going this way. He had an absolute transformation. The name Paul means humble or small. Humble or small. Have you ever had to be humbled? I have. Don't start calling me Paul, though. I might, I might have a complex or something. But was it not Paul that said that he must decrease and God must increase? The things that he went through in his life, he reminds me of me when I was younger. I think I said this before. I, I had this saying, where there's a Nathan, there's a way. How ridiculous was that? Now that I think about it, I can't even believe I said it out loud. Um, but I used to say that all the time because I was so confident that there was nothing I couldn't do, nothing I couldn't accomplish. If I put my mind to it, I could do it. And I do believe that I can do that now, but now I believe I can do it through God's strength. Because the Word says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? Right? That's what Paul had to learn. Now he's humble or small. I have taken some massive hits because of my own decisions. Massive hits that have humbled me. So as I'm reading this and I'm looking at, at the, his life and what he's gone through, what he's done, how he's been humbled, how he, he was, like I said, there wasn't a horse, but he was knocked off of his high horse, right? Right? I think we've all kind of been knocked off of our high horse, and in some ways or another, we can, we can relate to Paul here. We can relate that maybe all of us have been humbled. There's been times where we've all felt small. But then the, the week after that, I'm going to jump into the second part of this, but I'll just give you a little heads up of what, what kind of the second part is going to be. The second part is going to be what Paul did with his life after that. Because I can also relate to that. What Paul did after that is he changed. He had to change. And because he changed, God did keep him alive through a lot, through a whole lot. His life wasn't perfect. My life's not perfect. He felt bad about a lot. He felt like he had just this, this thorn in his flesh, something that was a constant reminder. If you did the things that he did, naturally you would probably be thinking a lot of that same stuff, right? I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of times, a lot of days that I get up and go, Nathan, how on earth did you make the decisions that you've made throughout your life? And it's hard. There are things in my life that I literally think about on a daily basis that I go, man, if I could only, if I could only take back the hurt that I caused other people, if I could only take back this decision, that decision, that decision. But all those decisions led me to who I am today. All those decisions in your lives, the thoughts in your lives, the feelings in your lives that you're going, man, if I could take that back, I would in a heartbeat. But God saw what I was going to do after those decisions. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows what you're going to do when you walk out this door. He knows what you're going to do for the rest of your life. That's why he's called you for what you're going to do, not what you did do. What you're going to do. And if you're not dead, you're not done. Period. That's just the fact of the matter. Some of us go, why am I still here? Well, you're here because there's a purpose. And if you're not dead, you're not done. So, so not next week, but the week after that, 
we're going to start laying out some stuff that God literally brought Saul out of that life and changed him for. What did he do it for? That's what we're really going to get into, and that's when it's really going to start getting fun. But I wanted to lay this foundation for everybody up front. So today, as we close, I just wanted to invite anybody that feels like that they're at a place where, where they need to forgive themselves, where they've made really hard bad decisions in the past that have affected their lives and they need to forgive themselves just like Jesus has forgiven you. I want to invite you to come up and we will uh, we'll pray for you. We've got several of the elders here. If any of the elders are in that spot, you feel free to get prayer too. But I don't want anybody to leave here and still have that feeling that I carried around for a really long time. I want to be able to pray for you. I want to be able for you to be able to go on with your life today on a new path, on a new direction, serving the purpose that God has purposefully created you for. If anybody needs healing, anybody needs restoration, anybody needs set free, we will pray for you. We will anoint you with oil, and, uh, and we'll see God work in your life. We'll watch this testimony unfold, and it'll be fun being part of it.